so uh, I'm going to be talking about today about spatial audio. I realize that this is a bit of an esoteric subject for this kind of crew, but um, this is something that I'm very passionate about, and uh, I think we're going to see that this is, to me, the future of high end audio, whether it be for theater, for theater, or for live performance. We're going to see a lot more of this coming down the line in pipes in the future. It's already on the way in different ways we're going to look at this best here today, but uh, this is a uh, there, there's some real, real opportunity to see spatial audio or the use of, like, well, I'm going to stay away from like, the, the notion of saying surround, even though that's the legacy of that, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But that, what I'm, my, my, my goal here today is to look at how we, well, it's just to look at essentially where this is coming from and where it's going to be going, and I think how we can use this in, in our high five context. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just speak over, uh, like, uh, this, this, again, this is called the introduction to spatial audio. You um, guys have my video? My, my feed? Oh, yeah. PowerPoint. I'll do a little bit of PowerPoint. Of course, feel free to come back before, it's, it's, you know, to whatever video you, 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 you feel is, is uh, appropriate. So, um, what I'm going to do real quick is just blast through this idea of, uh, of the history of surround time. And just because it gives a little bit of context, especially in terms of the chicken of the egg, in terms of technology and implementation. So if we go way back, the original stereo was developed in the 1930s um, by the, the Bell Labs. And it's still the same type of technology that we use today. Interestingly, though, they came up with the left, center, right as the best format, as the best means for, for projecting sound. So, uh, like, to be, if we were going to follow their, their, their research, we should all have LCRs uh, in, our, in, our, in our rooms, and that would be the best stage. And every time I actually work with, so I, I do fair amount of 5.1 uh, mixing, and every time I have that center speaker in there, man, does it change the, the sound stage in front of you. It allows so much more localization and definition in there. But unfortunately, just because of practicality and through the, through the ages, we lost that center channel for most of our work. So we've essentially moved down to, um, uh, well, yeah, in this case, they didn't have surrounds, but they were playing a pretty large river hall, and so they gave us a fairly good sense of development, which uh, is something that we all kind of, well, not we all, but I'd say that's something that we go for a lot, um, is that sense of development. And so that's going to be kind of what I'm pushing towards, is this, why, this, this sense of development, this sense of surrounding, sense of being there, the being at the venue or at the, in the scene. And so they, got, they didn't have surrounds, but they were in a room, 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 which gives you that impression of being immersed in audio. So, um, yeah, I love, I love the old school uh, audio way back before these kind of tech. It was bleeding edge, just making everything from pan pots to uh, faders to anything. It's, it was a very interesting era. So, the big first implementation was Fantasia, 1938 to 1941. Um, with the rise of fancy sound. Have you ever heard of fancy sound? So we actually have some of the, some of the original hardware at CU Denver where I teach. Uh, we, we landed on some of the stuff. It's pretty cool to see this original hardware and the original, original work that they were doing there. But um, it, was, it, was, it was made to make a splash with Fantasia. Disney wasn't doing too well. And they wanted to come up with something pretty cool. I mean, even still, watching Fantasia now, it's still an amazing piece of art. It's, it's, it's crazy how those early Disney films were able to pull off what they did. But they really wanted to pull it off big. And so they, had, they developed this thing called Fantasound. Uh, as kind of, I won't say a shtick, but it was because it was true technology. But it was definitely some, a, 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 like not a, even a gimmick, but it was something to to draw the audiences into the theater. So, um, but interestingly, after a lot of different eight different designs, they landed on uh, this concept of three front speakers, two center speakers, uh, which is similar to our, our modern 5.0. Um, and again, that's going to be kind of a trend that we're looking at here is these development of standards of how we do surround and how we, how we come up with speaker arrangements and the problems associated with that. So anyway, we, we, and they ended up with Fancy Sound for a while. Um, and it was cool because it really led to a push in, uh, in the technology, in the growth of technology for surround. Um, they did it as 13, yes, 13 specific theaters, and then they were going to try and do it as a road show. But ultimately, it ended up failing. Um, it was just so much to ask, uh, ask theaters and to, to, to upgrade their hard, on the hardware side. And that's really what ends up happening we see throughout the industry and even you know, at some, a show like this where somebody like me is going, we should be all surround, we should be all surround. 
And everyone's like, yeah, but I have to buy a whole bunch more speakers and it's really expensive. And what we don't want to do is invest a whole bunch of money into something that's going to be maybe not around in the next few years. We've seen, I mean, we've probably all witnessed tech or, you know, technology wars where you invest a lot of gear in one, in one direction and then a few years later it doesn't exist. And especially when the stakes are as high as something, a show like this where you have tens of, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars of investment, or if you're a commercial movie theater, cinema theater that has to make money for you to go through this mega upgrade that the studios are asking you to do and then for it to flop, that's a big ask. So that was the thing that, that ultimately ended up, led to its demise, plus World War II happened. Um, I don't know, it's hard to see it probably, but these, I don't know if you can see it, but these are the three fronts in the front, front there. Can you see how tall those towers are? Those are, they're insane. So this is, and this is the 1930s tech, but it's still, very, very cool. Um, it's just kind of a cool picture of the, of the, of the theaters. So post-World War II, we had a, a, a significant increase in, the, in, in permanent man magnets that really led to a lot better microphones and loudspeaker technology. Um, and plus, we had a lot better tape technology that we basically took as booty from the Germans after World War II. They uh, had great tape ta tape technology, which we still actually use a lot of today. Um, but through the 50s, the people that we had, we see, definitely saw the rise of television and broadcast. And with that, we see the, the, a significant decline in cinema. And so, um, and again, I, so, so just to be clear here, I'm going through like the history in terms of cinema because this is where a lot of the, the surround innovation comes from, but then we'll shift more into the music side of things here in a little bit and look at the kind of the way both of those uh, run to, bleed into, into one another. But um, yeah, so in the 50s, the, 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 the rise of television really brought down the attendance in terms of cinema goes. Um, and then the high cost of, of striping print releases led to the end of theater multi-channel because for, for, to do the, 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 I don't have pictures of it, but basically the film, the, the audio track is on the, on the side of the track as an optical track and it's actually just a waveform as it's, as it's going by. And you have to, to add extra channels, you had to add extra either reels or like sometimes they'd be actually on reels together or you have to actually add extra space on the side of the, of the, of the, the film and it just added to a lot of costs. And I was like, yeah, is it worth it? I don't know. So through the 50s and 70s though, um, Stereo becomes a, a, a stereo comes home and becomes a simplification of theater practices. So we really start to see a rise in in the the use of stereo, and I'm sure a lot of people in here have different like re, like recordings of both the mono and the stereo versions of stuff through those eras. Um, as, but especially in terms of delivery format, and that's 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 kind of where things are going to be going is like the, the discussion comes to down to is delivery format. So at the time, the big the big delivery format is of course LPs and, and vinyl. And vinyl has two walls, you know, a groove that basically the, 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 the needle can sit in. And so you can do stereo very well, but doing something more than stereo is pretty difficult. So, um, so basically we just, we had, we had, we had stereo and then all the later formats followed that suit just because we already had those recordings done. They were already mastered. It can be remastered. They're already mixed, but they could be, essentially remastered for, for every following generation at that point. And also things like headphones really start to, to play in that we have headphones that you can just put on and it, it makes a lot of sense. Two, two channels for two speakers in the room also correlate very well to two channels on wearing headphones. So it's very natural that we stick with two channels. But we did see that there's a quad, the quad era through the 60s and the 70s. Um, anybody have any quad recordings? Nice, what for, and what format? In like on, on vinyl? Yeah, so um, there's, there, there's some really clever ways of doing how to, so, so the, the big brains in the labs are trying to figure out how do we stuff more tracks into the same format? And this, this could have been so cool, but as again, it's, it's, it's industry driven that there's competing formats and competing, and competing technologies going on here. And when you're, again, asking the consumer to do a bunch of upgrades on their stuff, it can be very challenging. So the two big ways, the two main ways of doing this are matrix encoding, which we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, which is use amplitude and phase relationship between the tracks to create the, to extract 
four channels out of two, which I still think is just genius. It's, the, it's an extremely clever way of doing things. It's not perfect by any means, but it's a pretty clever way of getting four channels out of two. But then there's also one doing an ultrasonic carrier where you have these um, r really high bandwidth vinyl that allows it to hide essentially information above the hearing range and then they can extract that and pull that back down into the audible range. And of course it's all done in analog, which is really cool. So the, again, there's some very clever ways on way to do this, but ultimately it failed. Um, because, yeah, you have to ask the, the users to go through a lot of hardware upgrades and also the competing formats. The format wars just never really, like, they, they really, really killed that format. Um, but it, in the end, but people who, uh, like, do you have a quad setup? Can you listen to it? Yeah. And so, I, I, like, I, it's, it's it, it, you know, I, like, I'm curious. I don't know. Like, I hear a lot of people that have, have them, but don't ever, can't ever listen to them. So we have a lot of studios, surround studios at school, and I have the ability to decode it. So sometimes we'll bring them in there and listen to it. But, uh, and it's pretty fun. It's pretty cool. But it's, it's, it, it feels more like a novelty than an, at this point than it is an actual, like, true, tried and true delivery format. But back in the 70s, so this is kind of where things come back. So four channels, so... This is where the matrix encoding really did like, work well. So in terms of music, it didn't work, but then in cinema, it worked extremely well. So Dolby came up with what they called Dolby Stereo. Well, I guess, yeah, they called it Dolby Stereo at the time, but, um, and it's, it's, it uses the matrix encoding. Again, we're not gonna go into the technology. There's tons of stuff out there on the tech in terms of how matrix encoding works. But um, Star Wars was really the first one that really pushed this out, and it really revolutionized things. And what made it so cool is that it's backwards compatible. And so basically, you can play it on a stereo system, or you can play it on a quad, or like, not even a quad. It's, so this, this version is not quad. It's, it's an LC, LCRS, so left, center, right, surround, and a mono surround. And so it's not a quad where it's like left front, right front, left rear, right rear. So it's, it's like a, a diamond shape. Um, but the, th the cool thing with this is that it's still, it's, it was so widely popular because you're not, you, you can, if you want to, you can upgrade and get the four channels, but you can also just run it as a stereo two track and it's just fine. So that really is going to lead to some very cool, and of course just the popularity of Star Wars uh, really helped push this thing, push this along. But again, Close Encounters came six months later after, for Close Encounters of Third Kind. I think it was, I don't remember what year that was. Does anybody know what Star Wars is? Was 78, I think, something like that. Can't remember what year that was. Um, yep, so we see, you know, classic Star Wars and Close Encounters. Then we also see IMAX starting to come into play. So IMAX has 75, 75 millimeters, with, but it has six magnetic strips. For, for, so they're using magnetic, they're not using optical, they're using magnetic strip, and, and they're discrete. So that it's not a matrix encoding. So now you have extremely high fidelity audio relative to what's been there before. Um, it's still, the tape speed isn't moving very fast and you know, the tape width isn't very, very big. So by modern standards, we would call it not as good, but for the era, it was fantastic. So, um, but at this point, they, they realized that those, 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 those tracks didn't have enough headroom, especially for the low frequency stuff where you want those big, big explosions and stuff. So they added essentially, they had three screen channels, one surround, and a baby boom channel. So, um, so at this point, it shows that we're using five channels. So I don't know why I don't know why they had this. They had room for for six tracks. I said three, one, and maybe they did two surrounds. I can't remember on this one. I don't know why I put one surround there. But they called it the, they called it the baby boom channel, and Superman in '78 uses the baby boom. And so the, at the first, for the first time, we're starting to use, you now they're not using any kind of base management system, but of course they are, but now we have this low frequency explosion. And it's something that, that's something you can do that you can't get from home. And so we're starting to see, again, the, the cinema is really driving the, the surround technology. Um, Apocalypse Now used, have, used, used the baby boom also extensively. But then we start getting into the 80s and early 90s. VHS and, and laser discs show up, which are really, pretty much only st stereo two channel, but they do have the Dolby stereo in there. And at that point, it's, um, they change it to code Dolby Pro Logic, which is still the same thing. Again, you look on any receiver or anything these days, you'll still see Dolby Pro Logic. It's still used a lot. Everything from, well, mostly in broadcast, uh, you'll see, see it, but we call it LTRT instead of left and right, which means it's a matrix encoded surround system. Um, but VHS, I mean, 
VHS for all its amazing glory, or for, 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 its, for all the good things that it is, <laughs> like in terms of p p compatibility, or like I guess portability of, of, for the first time you could really rent movies and bring them home, that was awesome. But it, from a, I guess from a fidelity standpoint in audio, not so good. Um, still really clever, but it was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was kind of a doomed format towards the end. But Laserdisc, um, I never had one, but was pretty good at 44.1 and 16-bit stereo. So again, a lot of us, we can like to scoff at that, but that, that era is pretty, pretty stinking awesome. So um, yeah, so I guess I was just in here, I said it laid 8,000 films in just a few years. That's a mess, and they're still done. Uh, like you almost always will still find a Dolby LTRT track in there. But it's important to understand the difference between discrete and matrix. So we, the matrix encoding is where you basically, you hide two tracks in two tracks. So you essentially you get four tracks out of two tracks. But it's, a it's, it's essentially um, encoded in there, and you, so you encode it and then you decode it on the, on the playback. But it doesn't, it's that you're gonna get a lot of smearing, you're gonna get a lot of bleed. It's not as, it's not as good as discrete. Discrete is when you have discrete channels. You essentially have one channel per speaker. And that's, 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 that's the big move that we move into. So as we move into digital surround standards, like through the, set, through the 80s, um, we start add, finding ways to add digital sound in there. And the cool thing is, at this point, they start doing it discrete. But there's, to do discrete channels, to do, say, six channels of, of discrete audio, if we move into 5.1 standards, six channels of discrete audio is a lot of bandwidth, more than that can be hold, held on a piece of, uh, of tape or, like, film. So Dolby and DTS go through and they, f they come up with the, uh, the perceptual codex that we still know today, like Dolby Digital, and they develop these things that allow them to be discrete but also highly compressed. And that's a lot of, that a lot of people have a beef that, you know, you could call it the, the equivalent of MP3 for film. But, um, but it works pretty well. Again, we, we like to knock it, but it worked really well for, for the era. Um, so then we, so, so yeah, we had five, so we call it 5.1 because it's five, cha five main channels and then a point one. So the point one is really called point one because it uses point one of the bandwidth of the rest of them. Not really point one, that's just what we call it, but that's how it ended up. So the big three came out, so we have Dolby uh, SRD, which is what we call Dolby Digital. So it's a 5.1, then we have a DTS 5.1, and then we have an SDDS 7.1. SDDS doesn't actually show up in home, it's only, for, it's only for cinema, but DTS and Dolby Digital are huge. Well, Dolby, Dolby Digital is huge and, and required on, on DVDs. So, and that's still used quite a bit today. Um, you know, we have some much better options, but still as a legacy format, works really well. And then, then Dolby started even adding stuffing more channels in there. So they did in 99, they used Dolby Surround EX for Star Wars 1. Um, was the 6.1, three front, three rear. So the idea though, it, and then it still shows up occasionally, but not really much. So this kind of leads us up to where we are, we're coming into next. So this is through the, through the 90s. And then since then, we've started to see a trend. But one of the problems with this, like even this one right here, is every time you change your format, you have to ask your end user to change their setup. And you, they have to conform to you. And the, the successful ones, for better or for worse, they tend to have the means to have backwards compatibility. So a lot of times, like these 6.1s, that 6.1 is still a 5.1 with a matrix encoded sixth channel. So it allows it so you can still, you can still use your 5.1 and your 6.1 alongside one another. And so I think that's going to be really where the success, success lies. But as we go further and further, as, as, as users want to get more immersed and more connected and feel the, the sound music more around us, it becomes more of a challenge. How do, we, how do we marry increasing channel counts with standards and formats? And it's very difficult. So the answer to that is spatial audio. And that's where we're into, that's the era that we're moving into and have been moving into the direction we've been moving into for a little while. So it's a very af active and developing scene. This is the research that I do, um, and this is, where, this is where I spend a lot of my time working in. So um, I came into this, and I think I have my slides a little bit out of order here, but I came into this a few years ago in terms of Gates Planetarium. So we developed this technology. We didn't develop the technology. We implemented this technology for Gates Planetarium here in Denver. So Gates Planetarium is a 15.1. Actually, I just have a slide for it. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll haul through it, see if I can find it. Come on. We'll come back to it. So this is what 
This is essentially the speaker arrangement at Gates Planetarium is currently even right now. It's about to change. But we, were, we brought in and we wanted to go make a show at, at the planetarium, or, or actually before that. So the planetariums come up and they make extremely cool shows. They're very immersive, they're, there's sound, there's three, well, I would say 180, I could say, <laughs> well, hemispherical video, so you can look around and you feel, you feel very connected and very in, in the scene of, of the content, but they're very expensive films to make. So, these, so they'd fly in like, say, Harrison Ford and have him do voiceover, or, or you know, some famous actor that can do voiceover, and they'll do voice, they'll create this immense production for, these, for, this, for, this, for this theater, but the problem is, it can only play in that theater, something along the lines of Fantasia, right? So it can only, if it can only play in that theater, that's a very expensive prospect for studios to, to go through and build that. So how do we free up this, this idea so that basically I can take this mix, I can make it for a planetarium, but then I can watch it at, at a different theater, like a different one. So like we have Fisk here in Boulder, then we have, the, the, we have a dome up in Fort Collins at the Museum of Discovery. Uh, we actually have a lot of domes here in Colorado. And how do we make it so it's, this show is more portable and thus can make more money? And for us, the answer was ambisonics, which is spatial audio. So spatial, uh, it, it, to, uh, and we fell upon this about a decade ago, and it was just this kind of quiet format that was developed in the 70s, um, but I, w I won't say it's boutique, but it's, well, I guess that's probably the right word. It's boutique, a boutique kind of format of representing audio, but it didn't have a lot of traction except for amongst small circles of passionate users. Um, so we ended up using it for this, for this application, and I thought it was the bee's knees, but you know, I've, been, I've been beating that drum for a long time now. I still think it's a very cool concept and cool technology. So, um, that, the, and, and we'll talk about why that is. Let's see, is that, yep, cool. So let's talk about the motivation for use. What, like, why use this, this concept of spatial audio? So I'll define it, and, and this definition will become more clear. Because one of the things, I like, especially if you've been by the room today, so, uh, or like in the last couple days, I have a room over in, in Red Rock 8. Uh, we have a big array set up from CU, uh, and it's a lot of fun to play around and experiment with. But a, a, lot of, a lot of them, there's like, what is this rig? So let's kind of define it. So well, what is spatial audio? So on the content, or actually let's say, why, why do we want to use spatial audio? And then and we'll, we'll, we'll define it a little bit more coming up. So on the content creation side, what that allows us to do is decouple the playback system from the content. So in other words, it doesn't matter what channel count you have, you use the same stream. And that's a very big deal. So in other words, I can, I can take this audio stream and I can play it back on a 15 channel at Gates Planetarium. I can play it on a 16 channel, one I have over in my room over here. I can play it back on stereo systems. I can play it on 5.1 and 7.1. It plays back, it can decode to any format. And that's huge. So now you have, again, you, the, the point being here is you decouple your content from your playback system. And that's, that's, that's the biggest point well, one of the biggest point, but a huge, huge point for this. Um, and so again, it doesn't matter what your speaker count is. And the cool thing is also, now as, a, as an end user, you can decide, okay, I wanna start with a, whatever, stereo system. And then I wanna add a, a center channel. And then I wanna add a single, mo a single surround. Then I wanna add another surround. Then I wanna add a high channel. Then I wanna add something below me. So you can do this as an incremental upgrade over time. And so it's not something, you don't have to buy into this system all at once and go, okay, this, invest in the system, this is gonna be it for the rest of my life. And then the format changes in a few years. But on the, on the on user side, yeah, so, it, so why, do we want to, why do we want to use spatial audio to begin with? Like, what's the whole point of doing surround? And what, just listening to the hallways here, you know, I've been doing these, 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 these fests for quite a long time, and I, I love listening to the conversations in the hallways and in the rooms, and like, what are people going for? Or you read the magazines, what are people going for? And, and you want to be connected to your content. In this case, for the most of what we see here at, the, at these festivals, it's music, but it could also be cinema as well is we want to be connected to the, to the content. We want to be immersed in it. And like, we want to be, feel like we're either in the scene, if it's a film, or if we want to be at the event. And I hear lots of stories, of, like horror stories, of, of bad mixes. And it's, it's really interesting when you survey how people use it around, because it is the Wild West. There's no, there's no such things as standards. In film, there kind of is. But in music, all bets are off. People can do weird stuff. Do you want to be inside the choir? and have them singing around you? Well, yes, it'd be very cool, but it's also weird. It's like, 
have you ever been standing inside of a choir? Maybe you have, and that's cool. But most of us don't go to see a choir or a concert or something like that where we're in the middle of it, which again is a kind of a cool idea, but it's also can be very like jarring and also too overwhelming. A lot of times if we listen to say classical, we want to feel like we're at the event and we're at the venue. And so that's why we use a significant amount of reverb in our recordings to give us the sense that we're actually at there. And then that's why we have rever slightly reverberant rooms and in terms of acoustics is to get that sense of envel envelopment. Or like a lot of the speakers here will have rear firing tweeters or some of these kind of uh, like, you know, interesting ways of bouncing sounds off of walls or to give you that sense of envelopment. A lot of even the modern sound bars that go on TVs, they're, they can be, they, they, they're sold as 5.1 sound bars and they have like rear firing or you have to find some ceiling, ceiling firing stuff to like give you this sense of envelopment. And the, the, the reason again we're, that we're doing this is that we want to be enveloped. We want to, we want to feel like we're there. We want to connect with the, the content. So this is, this is my, this is why I, I, I'm such a proponent of this because it really does, especially having played with this for a long time, when you, when you start adding just, even just a little bit of reverb behind you um, for the space, you feel like you're there. Like, in fact, it's, it's almost so subtle you don't even notice it until you take it away. I'll be mixing on a 5.1 system for a while and I'm just adding a little bit of reverb or something like that behind me. And you don't even, again, you don't even feel like, you, you don't even feel that it's there. But then all of a sudden you do it to check it down to a stereo mix. You go, ching, goes, and you're like, oh, it feels so flat and two-dimensional. And even with all the amount of reverb and all the amount of technology and all that kind of stuff that you can add to the stereo, it just doesn't have that same sense of envelopment. So, and it's up to the content creators to decide how they want to do that. If you're working with like electronic music, you can do all sorts of fun stuff, flying stuff around. When you're working with rock, it's a little weird, and there's some weird stuff happening if you're, you're trying to mix a rock record in spatial or surround. Like, how do you use the surrounds? Do you put reverb in there? Do you put audience members back there? Do you put backing vocals? Because again, that's, that's, when you go see a band, usually you're gonna go see, see them there. But, but something like a jazz trio, if you wanna go see a jazz trio, you can add just a little bit of club reverb, or even if, if it's an actual live recording, you record some of the audience, you get some glasses clinking, you get some footsteps behind you, and it feels like you're there. And especially if you marry it with video, you are like, I feel like, and even one step further, go into VR, you can really feel like you're there. And so, um, so the cool thing though here is that, again, we're kind of decoupling the, the, the I'm, I'm gonna keep saying that, because I think that's, that's a really important point, is that you're decoupling your playback from your content creation. So um, this is just a kind of a cool, I don't know, you, you'll, you'll see these, there's a bunch of kefs uh, floating around at, at the DTF Co Co Copenhagen. Copenhagen. Um, this is kind of some of the bleeding edge stuff that you'll see. Those are some really expensive rooms. Uh, the, the room that I have set up over in Red Rock 8, that's a, it's a 16.1 that I borrowed from CU Denver. Um, it's a fairly portable mobile setup, it's pretty fun. Uh, I have a number of different setups that we use. We have a much larger system that I take to music festivals and we teach DJs and content creators how to work in 3D. I also have a dome that I just brought to Burning Man last week for a week and we did, we did spatial audio out, out in the desert, all solar powered, pretty fun. So let's talk about how we can, how, where, where can this, these, these be used? And we'll funnel, we're gonna funnel down and circle back into it like a little more, how this uh, is it more, a little bit more appropriate for um, this, the, the, like the audio file and hi-fi applications. But where do we see, where do we spatial audio being used? Of course cinema. Cinema is gonna be the big driver for this sort of thing. And, and they're trying to get butts in seats out of the home theaters. So how do they do it? They're, they're, they tend to be almost always the, the, the leading innovators for this, these kind of technologies. So cinema and theaters where we're gonna see a lot of this happening. But also seeing this in video, and it can be streaming or downloaded or played back in digital format, but 360 video and flat screen. So 360 video is where we're seeing a lot of this. It's already happening. Go on, on YouTube, go on Vimeo, go on, on uh, Facebook. If, the, if somebody posts 360 video, you can have 360 audio. It doesn't always have to be, but if it's recorded right and mixed right, you have 360 audio. Meaning, if you change your perspective and you drag your mouse and you move around and you have, say, uh, whatever, uh, a car idling over here or honking its horn, if you pan and you're wearing headphones and you pan away, it's gonna, it, it, it's gonna maintain its position where it goes. It's not, it's not the best, but the algorithms are, because are, 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 it uses a lot of bandwidth to do this, but, they're using first order animasonics and it works pretty stinking well. It's pretty cool. Um, I remember when I saw the first few videos that came out, it was, it was, a, big, it was a big big, deal on Facebook when they first launched this in our weird little circles of that, that deal with this stuff. So everyone's like, oh, there's this monkey thing that you can listen, you basically they set up a 360 camera and the monkey 
habitat and there's, you're in with all these chimps and you can like look around and the chimps stay where they stay, the voices stay with the, the chimp. And it's supposed to be very immersive. It was cool, it was young, but I was, I was less than impressed. But since then we've seen a huge improvement with this, these technologies, it's really cool. And the, the tools for content creators have gotten a lot better too. But virtual, reality, virtual and augmented reality, this is where we're seeing a lot of innovation happening. Um, if you haven't played with three, VR, I was a skeptic for a long time. And then we had a VR party at my house and I was hooked. It is cool. It's, there's, there's gonna be a lot of movement happening here, especially in the, the augmented reality side of things too, whether it be on your phone or eventually gonna be something that you wear on, in your daily life. When you add audio on top of that, that's overlaid in, three spa in spatial, it's, you're gonna see some really cool stuff. So live performance. We can see concerts, theaters, festivals, and art installations. This is my world. This is where I live. And so I do a lot with, not so much concerts, but I do more with theater. So last night, we did an immersive theater here in town called Zabidi. Um, this is the last weekend of it. I just went to it, saw it for the first time. But it's, uh, we have a, a size about this space in here. Actually, the warehouse is much larger. But we have a ring of, we have a 16.1, a huge 16.1. And we have live actors, aerialists. Um, and you're, the audience is walking around in this space. And you have everything from crows and birds to bugs and, and water sounds, to uh, magical spells that swirl around you, as well as the musicians that are overlaying and playing with this thing. And the music flows around, and with uh, live musicians and pre-recorded musicians, it, I mean, because I was part of it, I was like, I was loving the technology. And most, most people were focused on the, on the performers, but it was such an enhanced experience to have spatial audio in a, in a, in a live performance that you're walking around in, and, and to the point where they had these crows that were crowing. And people were like, are there crows in it? Because it was all dark and they have these spotlights and it's in a warehouse and people thought there were real crows like flying around in the place because it, it could happen. And people, but I was standing next to this, this, these people and they're like, are there crows in here? Because they're like, it sounded really real. They had a great crow sample. And so and it, was, it, was, it was to the point where I was like, I thought so too. I thought there were really crows flown around in there. And then of course video games. Video games are really pushing the envelope on this sort of thing too. So video games now, um, we're starting to see a lot of space, the use of spatial audio in there. And it's, it's, it's really cool. So those are, the, those are the, gonna be the main drivers of this. So let's take a look real quick at the, the spatial audio types that we can look at here. So spatial audio, I, I, I use, I, it comes in different things, especially if you're, I, the, through the conversations I've been having over the weekend over in, the, in our room. It's, it's interesting to hear people's um, experiences and impressions of, 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 of with spatial audio. But basically, we can kind of break this down into a couple different categories. So we have the commercial use of it, which is gonna be things like Dolby Atmos, DTS-X, and Oro 3D. Those are the big ones right now that are really pushing it. And Atmos be really pushing the market in, in a big way. So when we set up over there, I was like, oh, is this like Dolby Atmos? And I'm like, it's exactly like Dolby Atmos. There's a little bit more to it. And on the content creation side, in terms of creating Dolby Atmos mixes, it requires a little bit of, well, especially if you're doing it for cinema, it's gonna be, it requires a lot of hardware and a lot of things. So Dolby, they, they take spatial audio, and they, that's traditional spatial audio, and then they add their own kind of algorithms and twists to this thing. Um, but under, under the hood, it's still spatial audio, but they do some really pretty cool stuff in terms of, of hardware and, and software integration on this. But um, it's very prohibitively expensive for like a, a general user to get into creating Adobe Atmos. Um, and DTSX is pretty cool. Oh, and and the, I guess oh, the problem with these, yeah, I guess this is my this is my big issue with these is that re they require predefined speaker arrangements. And this goes back to the same kind of idea. The problems that we've had with previous formats is that if you have to have a five one or a seven one or something like that, if you don't have that that exact speaker arrangement, that you're going to have a less lessened experience. But the cool thing is, I mean, the, 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 these these people know what they're doing. And so they're, they basically are building off of legacy formats, like a 5.1 or 7.1, and they're adding high channels or lower channels or something. So that basically it's essentially backwards compatible so that if you have more speakers and you have the means to buy them, you can upgrade your system and get more immersed. But if you don't have those height speakers, you're still gonna get a good experience. And so you, and you're still gonna hear the mix as it should be for the most part. But it's not gonna be perfect. DTSX is gonna be a little bit more fluid in terms of their speaker arrangement. It's pretty cool. Um, and Oro 3D has some pretty strict ref defined, uh, anybody, I'm curious, just has anybody ever seen an Oro 3D uh, in, in, in real life? Yeah, it's, it's, it, we just, it's, it's bigger in Europe, but we don't, see it, we don't see it as much here, but I'm just curious to see if anybody's actually seen anything like that. But then we have ambisonics. 
So Amazonics is the, is the old school version of this thing, and it's been around for, since about the 70s when the, some big brains in Britain came, developed this technology. And I'm gonna go over it real quick just because I want you to understand how spatial audio works under the hood. Not in terms of like hardcore math or anything like that, but I want you to understand what it is and how it fundamentally dif differs than our other traditional formats. So that when you're, when you're dealing with it, be it Dolby Atmos or these Amazonic formats that are like Facebook 360, YouTube, that you understand what those are. So that's essentially what we're going for. Cool, hello. <laughs> So, again, when, when I'm doing these, when I'm over at the room, a lot of times people are like, well, is this like, is it like, is this, is, is what you're doing like Dolby Atmos? I'm like, yes, it's very much like Dolby Atmos. And essentially what we're doing is, we, well, we call it object-based mixing, but we'll talk about that in a minute. You don't have to read all that. I'll just, I'll, 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 I'll paraphrase this thing. Basically, if we have, and this is, the, this is an example I give a lot, is if we have like basically a sound source, say a birdie sitting in a tree and that birdie's sitting up over here to my upper left. That little birdie creates a wave field as it chirps that emanates from that bird, as it spreads out from that, spreads out from that bird. Well, what we can do is we can actually capture, and we can create that virtual wave, we can capture that, well, I can either record it or I can synthesize it, this virtual wave field. But essentially what I'm doing, and, and, and what I'm doing is I'm creating a 3D wave environment inside my computer or in the recording, however you want to do it. So I have like a recorder here that we can record it. But what we do is we essentially create a 3D wave field, and that's what we're streaming. And then what we, uh, that's on the encoding side. And then on the decoding side, we're basically decoding it to our speaker arrangement. But we've got this virtual 3D audio world that's happening in this, we'll say it's in this space right here right now. And then what we do is we put speakers around. And those speakers act like windows into that 3D world. So whether you have a speaker there or not, something like if, if I have, say, a 5.1 set up in front of me and I have a bird tweeting over here, the system is going to respond by playing back that, that bird tweeting over here through the left and the, the right, uh, left and the left around as if it were coming up here. It's not going to be great because I'm not going to have any height information, but it will translate that, yes, I hear that there's a bird coming from over here. Now, if I add speakers above me, it's going to go, oh, yeah, I can use those four speakers above or five speakers or however many speakers you have to create and, and use the, the, well, essentially a matrix of those speakers to, to give the impression that the bird is coming from up here. But again, the cool thing here is that it's the same audio stream. It's just windows into that, that virtual 3D world that's going to give us that resolution. So the cool thing is the more speakers you have, the more resolution you have. And that just makes a lot of sense. It's like, it's like pixels on a screen. On a, on a monitor or on a projector. The more, the more pixels you have, the more resolution you have. Well, the same thing happens with speakers. So you can, so you can decode this all the way down to mono or all the way up to essentially infinity, uh, which is what we call wave field synthesis. And so it's basically recreating the wave in a very, like, that's more theoretical and that's the crazy stuff you see in labs. In a practical sense, we, we like to see something, you know, like five channels, seven channels, nine channels, 11 channels, 16 channels. That's, those are the kind of the kind of channel counts we're working with. But of course, with 16 channels comes all the associated cabling costs and amplifiers and all that kind of stuff. So it gets expensive. Um, so I'm just going to talk about this real quick. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. This isn't that interesting, but it's just, it's just worth noting that basically we talk about in terms of spatial audio, we call it, in, in ambisonics, we call it the order of the orders. So first order ambisonics means it's going to ha it uses four audio channels, and we'll see this in a minute, it uses four audio channels to resolve this. But in other words, going back to that birdie, little birdie in the tree example over here, if I'm working with first order ambisonics, it'll sound like a kind of like it's coming from over there, sort of. It won't be like a sharp image. As we go up in our orders, as our channel counts increase, then our, our, our resolution, our definition, our, our directivity becomes more defined and more defined. So in other words, if I want that little tiny tweeting bird in the tree to sound like it's right there, if I close my eyes and I go, oh man, there's a bird right there, like I can point directly to it you have to use like higher order channel counts. I, in a practical level, we run up to about third order. You can go up to 11th order and higher, but those, you're talking hundreds of channels of audio. And now, it's important to understand here, when I say channels, I don't mean, uh, I don't mean per how many speakers there are. And this is the biggest thing that, I'm, that, that I run to in terms of, of, of understanding this stuff, is that people associate the channel count with the speakers, but again, those are two decoupled, completely different things. I'll, I'll explain that, and I'll explain this in a little bit more detail as we go here. So we'll see this term, see, sometimes see this term, HOA, high order ambisonics. Just want to get, just so you understand what that term means. 
So we call these things spherical harmonics. Don't worry about this very much. I just think it's kind of cool and pretty looking. But basically, if we want to look at, so we call zeroth order, it's, it's, it's omnidirectional. If we go to what we call first order, we have to use those channels, the, the three channels below, plus that first one there. So what this is going to do, and those, those are essentially polar patterns. We have one in the X, one in the Y, one in the Z, and then we have an omni. And these are audio channels, but what they do is they encode based off a of phase relationship between these, they will encode the directionality. So if I have an, something that's, we'll say, just uh, completely positive in the X, Y, and the Z, it's going gonna, it's gonna to locate in that direction. If this is X, this is Y, this is Z, it's going to locate in that direction right there. And W is going to be the omni. It's going to tell us the distance, how far something is away. So with four audio channels, we can encode a wave field, which is pretty, st again, this is really clever stuff. Um, and this is developed back when we didn't really have a lot of tech, there's not a lot of use for it because there was no really encoders or decoders for it. It was more mathematical theory, but now we have fast computers that can do this on the fly. We can do some really cool stuff with this. So then if we go to second order, we add these other lobes right here. And what that does essentially, and they're weird shapes, but they give you more resolution in the X, the Y, and the Z by adding more of these lobes. And then of course we go to third order. So, so second order takes nine channels of audio, third order takes 16 channels of audio, and first, and, uh, first takes four, and zero takes one. But it's, and so the weird thing is here, we're using audio channels to encode the 3D wave field. It's not like a data stream. So, I could, so when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm playing this back, I could solo out any one of these. I listen to, if I solo out the second order, one of the second order tracks, and listen to it, it just sounds like sound. You don't really understand it. But it's only when you start to like decode all of these together that it gives you this 3D wave field. Again, very clever stuff. So, because um, we could do other, we could do other formats, things like working in digital streams, but this is just, it just works. It's really cool. It's really clever stuff. So let's talk about how we encode this stuff. How do we make 3D audio? Uh, and then, I'm going to blast through this really quickly because what we care about, we don't care about how we make it. We care about how we listen to it. And that's going to be the important part. But I want you to understand how this stuff is made. Because even, even through this show, I've, I've actually run into a number of people that, I've been, are, that are out there in the field recording their, uh, with, with Amazonics. So we, we can, there's a few different ways. Um, and again, the cool thing is with this is you can, you can record, like say a quintet. If I go up and I sit and record a quintet and I play it back, it will give you a sense that you were right there. And you can put it, play, play it back on headphones, you can play it back on 5.1, you can play it back on stereo. It's amazing what this technology can do. So if I go and I record this, so I've got a lot of my little sound devices, Mix Pre 6 here, and my Sennheiser Ambio. So that's the one that's showing up on screen right there. Um, so we're starting to see this. It used to be a very boutique thing, but now we're starting to see these microphones manufacturers are getting into the game um, that are creating this. So this is a tetrahedral mic microphone here, and what it does is it picks up in 360. So this is actually records in what's called A format. So it's a, it's a different one. These are four cardioid mics, but it records in A format. Then we have to convert it to B format, which is what the X, Y, Z, and W. And they, ha they have these, uh, this is, it can be done in analog, but most of it's done in digital domain these days. Um, and now we're starting to see some more microphones that can record at higher resolutions. So this is a first order Amazonic microphone right here. And if I play this, so if I go out and I record this, and I went to like, say, New Mexico, and I record like out in the field, and because I live in the city here, I forgot how many crickets there are. And so I was out, I was out in New Mexico, and I just walked outside one night, and I was like, whoa, there are a lot of crickets here. So I put this up, and I just set this out, and it's recorded. Of course, you can always hear like roads in the background. And, uh, but I, I was able to record this, and then I just brought this back, and I play it back on my big rig, and you're like, whoa, it feels like you're in New Mexico with crickets everywhere. It feels really, it really brings you back. Or like, I'll take this, take this uh, to Mexico and, and put this by the beach for like 20 minutes. When you're having a bad day, throw this on, and you're like, ah, oh, you feel like you're at the beach. But you can do the same thing with a quintet. You can do this with, a, with, with whatever kind of sound source you want to work with there. So, um, and the cool thing is all the big players, like this is Sennheiser, uh, Rhodes getting into the game. We're starting to see a lot of manufacturers. It used to be very boutique, and now you're starting to see some really big innovation. And then Soundfield, or wait, uh, oh man. Yeah, so Soundfield, brain farting all of a sudden. Uh, that's been do making them for quite some time. But the price of these and the barrier of entry for getting on, in on this is getting a lot, lot less. But I was talking to a, gen a gentleman who has one of these, and he, brought, he brings it to all the shows he goes to, and then he brings it home. And he doesn't have a surround system, but he's, yet, he's able to decode it down to binaural and listen to it in, on headphones, and it feels like exactly like you're there. So that's, and that's something that I'm going to start, start talking more about, is that 
binaural, uh, how, do, how do we implement this stuff? And headphones are the future for this stuff. The other thing is object-based object, object -based panning. So I can synthesize the wave field. So I can decide, I can, in, using a panner in my, in my workstation, I can put stuff, I can record something. Say I've, I, want to, I want to put the trumpet there, I want to put the tuba there, and I want to put the trombone there, and I want to put something over here. If I have an individual recording of each of those, I can place those in 3D space, and I can create the wave field in the computer. And so that's what I'm doing. That's what most of what I'm doing over in the, over there, in the, the room over here is I'm just basically I don't have any recordings. I'm just moving, panning stuff around in 3D. Super fun. So this is how we do. This is how we do stuff for feature films like yeah, Atmos DTS and Oro 3D. Um, those are the panners. But most of what we're seeing a lot of these days, especially in cinema, is it's a hybrid format. So you're going to use a combination of that and spot mic. So if I were, if I if I were to go record say a symphony or a choir, or something, I'll set up a, a, a spatial mic. But I'm also going to go set up spot mics for the, for the end so I can enhance them because it feels very, very, very distant a lot of times. So it's going to allow us to get mix in and create a hybrid of, of a synthesized overlaid with a recorded version of that. And that's how a lot of stuff is done, like films. Um, basically, in films, you have your, your sound bed, which is going to be a spatial mix, and then you have, still have your objects uh, that fly around, uh, like if you want a helicopter flying by or bullets whizzing by, you'll, you'll use something like that. So let's talk about decoding. This is the big one right here. So how do we play back this material? So say you go out and buy this stuff, and you want to go, okay, I'm going to go grab this kick-ass recording of whatever, Grand Central, well, that's kind of boring. I'm trying to think what would be cool. Like a firework show. Actually, I've heard a couple of really cool firework shows that were recorded that you go, and you want to give it to feel like you're at 4th of July. And you, you go up and you set this and you want these big booms coming from all over the place. Well, usually kind of in one area. That you go and record this, you're like, okay, now how do I play this thing back? And that's, that can be a bit of a challenge. Because most of us don't have, necessarily have, like, uh, uh, Dolby Atmos encoding software. It's really expensive. <laughs> so most of us don't have that sort of thing. So anyway, how do we, so how, in other words, how do we translate the wave field stream with, that we've captured into something that, that, that because of our speaker arrangement. So um, I said it can only really resolve, resolve where there's actually speakers. So in other words, if I want it to sound like it's, it's exploding above me, like the firework example, if I have a 5.1, it's not going to work very well. It will work OK, because I want my 5.1 arrangement right here, if I have sound sources coming here, here it's going to distribute that as among those five speakers. But it's not going to work very well, unless I have the speakers coming above me. Or maybe you want to feel like you have a subway running underneath you. Well, unless you have speakers underneath you, which sometimes you do. I mean, like there are places that you can do that or you'd have lower speakers to give the sound. That, that it's going to be very difficult for stuff to sound to de decode where there's not speakers. It works okay, but it's not great. Um, so the decoder is going to basically, yeah. So the decoder is going to tell the sounds. Like basically, the decoder knows where the speakers are. And this is going to be a challenge. You have to figure out where the speakers are in your room. And this is why Dolby predefines all of where your speaker range is. Because... If everybody was just willy-nilly putting speakers wherever they wanted, it would be very difficult for people to have good decoding on, on, their, on their playback. So Dolby goes, this is how your speakers should be. And you go, OK, I put speakers there. But the cool thing is, it, it, you, you, whether you go from a, a 7.1 to an 11.1, you can still use the same audio stream. So it's still spatial. It's just now you add the added height, and it goes, cool. Now you can actually hear more of the height information that's going through your speakers. So, like, again, you can't fly sounds where, if there's no speakers there. You can, it just doesn't work very well. And then a lot of times on our decoders, we're going to start adding things like bass management, room optimization, EQ, DSP, and any other kind of stuff that needs to happen to, to, to make your system sound a lot better. Um, so the, the, the way we're going to do this, though, is that, we, again, we have our spatial audio stream, and it can go down to stereo, to 5.1 or 7.1 surround. We can go to high channel count surround system. So if you want to go something like 11.1 or, you know, any of the more boutique, high channel count systems. But the big one that we're seeing, and this is what's really pushing the market right now, is binaural. Is that I can take spatial down to binaural. And again, this is going back to our, our streaming video example, that's where we're seeing it happen. Or video games. It's huge in video games and in VR. This is where we're seeing it. So binaural is really pushing it. But binaural, on the fly binaural is still a young, I mean, binaural's been around forever. Binaural recording's been around for a really long time. And if you haven't experienced it, it's, it's fantastic. But there's a lot of techniques that go along with it. Because binaural relies, binaural, for, for those of you that haven't had experience with it, binaural means basically it uses header-related transfer functions to create 3D. We have two ears. But, um, 
but we hear in 3D. So our ear, this ear can hear and track in 3D. And the combination of these two ears and this head shape, this nose, these glasses, this hat, they give the, that my brain is able to filter that. So if I have some sound coming from up, up to my right over there, my brain is able to decode where that's coming from. Even with two ears, I'm able to localize where stuff is in 3D. So binaural has mapped and figured out how our hearing system works, how our, our, our filtering works, how our head, head sizes work, and allows us to, well, we can either record it using a dummy head, which is the traditional way of doing it, or we can recreate it and decode to it on the fly using head-related transfer function filters. And this is, again, this is, a very, this, is a, this is a very active area of research right now. Because what, it's, it's essentially right now, the, it's the equivalent of putting your, your, your brain in somebody else's head and listening to it. You know, we always talk about, like, does banana taste the same to you as it does to me? Or whatever. does red look like red to you as it does to me? Well, the same thing happens with hearing. If I hear a train drive by, does it sound the same to me as it does to you? In terms of the way our, our brains are actually wired, that's a little bit different. But in terms of our phys physical stuff, if I put my, my brain in your head, that's essentially what we're doing with the modern, most modern binaural decoding. And things are going to be cool, getting really cool. Everything from like head, tra like head scanning, and that, gonna be, it's going to be much more customized to you to the point where basically these head related, this binaural stuff, is your ear and your hearing. And so that all of a sudden, it's getting better and better and better defined. So when you put headphones on, you're gonna hear that person walking across the room in front of you, even though they don't exist, to the point where it feels like a hologram. And especially if you work with augmented reality, you have visual holograms and audio holograms that marry with one another to the point where it's gonna be very cool. But the cool thing with that is that your buy-in for this technology is a pair of nice headphones. It's not a huge rig. I love huge rigs. <laughs> That's where I work. I love big speaker systems. But this is where the technology is really pushing right now. But the cool thing is, we'll let the, the, the binaural people really create all the technology, and then we can implement it using big, high, big awesome speakers. So uh, that, that's, that's kind of how I roll with this stuff these days. So the delivery system. How do we, how do we, how do we listen to this stuff? So on speaker playback, we have, we have like Dolby Atmos, RO3D, DTSX, and commercial decoders. So this isn't a very DIY approach. This is how you're gonna listen to stuff played back. But, um, and then there's gonna be like some live performance systems, the stuff that I work on, the stuff that I make. There's, so I, my group is called Signal Noise Media Labs. There's other companies out there like Envel or Envelop out of San Francisco that are doing some of this stuff. Um, there's some commercial big, the like not theater stuff, but big concert venues that are doing some of this stuff. But again, the big one is headphones for binaural. You'll, you'll see in VR, you have like the Vive, uh, Oculus, um, and then there's a bunch more coming out right uh, as we speak. 360 video, video games, and head tracking headphones. The Odyssey Mobius, anybody played with that yet? Uh, so I had one here last year. Um, it's pretty cool. You put, it on, you put on these Bluetooth headphones, and you press play, and it's Bluetooth, and so, so it's wireless, and as you walk around, you're like, whoa. Basically, they set up with playing stereo playback with those. It sounds like there's two st stereo speakers right there, and you move your head, and they stay right there. And you're like, whoa, that's crazy. But what they do is they have to add a little bit of reverb in there and a little bit of room reverb to give you that sense of space. To me, it's distortion. I don't like that. So I like to hear music as it was created. And that's one of the things in terms of like what we do here, in terms of fidelity, we want to hear the music. We want to hear the artist's intent. We want to, hear, we want to be connected with the root. Like, to me, that's what audiophilia is, is removing distortion and removing barriers to that, to that music. And so when we're adding, adding things into the stream, that's, that's a little bit counter, as a, the purist in me doesn't very really much like it. Even if it's a pretty cool magic trick, the purist in me has a hard time with that. So that's, kind of, that's the kind of the internal battle I deal with right now. So in terms of spatial audio and hi-fi, so how do, we, how do we marry these two? Because again, this is, this is uh, I would say this is going to be a boutique area of spatial audio. Is, is, is how do we get these beautiful concert recordings these, these, these classical recordings that, done in spatial audio. It's, it's still a boutique format, especially there's nothing I know of yet that's streaming spatial, except for I mean, Facebook 360 and those kind of things, but I don't consider those really hi-fi. Those are cool, but those aren't, those aren't really hi-fi. So we still have a chicken or the egg issue we're going on right now. So who wants to start making content and then who wants to start making decoders? And so that's, that's kind of the, 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 the issue that we're working, we're still in the, the, the throes of that right now. Um, we're, we're yeah, pretty far along right now with VR and 360 video. So the cool thing is the technology is advancing very quickly, but we can, we can, we can grow, we can develop in, in hi-fi world along with those. So and the, the cool thing with this, 
especially with this scene here, is that there's a lot of money at stake here. And it's, the, the nice thing is with this approach is that it's a, it's a measured addition to it. So in other words, if I go out and I buy a $50,000 speaker system, that if I want to go add another channel a couple of years, years later, or if I find a used pair on Audiogon or something like that, that or through some dealer, that I can add those incrementally as needed uh, and still be, get a, a really good experience without the ne need to jump in all the way into the deep end all the way at, at, at one time. So I think there's, a, there's some really cool opportunity here. And just because I think it's the, the, that we have now as content creators, we have the ability to create really cool content that can be delivered to many different formats. So that's essentially where I'm seeing the, the future of this stuff going is yeah, a lot of innovation happening right here. Um, we're, we're, we're kind of riding on the coattails of video games in, in, in VR, but again, that's, that they're, they're, they're developing the tech and we implement it in a very high fidelity way. And I think that there's, that's gonna be really cool to see how that happens. But we need to keep asking our content creators, asking our record labels, asking our recordists to start doing a lot more of this and to work in this, in this area. Because it's not that hard. All of our tools now in, in Pro Audio now are, it can work with Amazonics. If you work in Logic or if you work in Nuendo, Pro Tools is okay, but um, there's a lot of tools really happening very quickly that allow us to work in this field. But it's still young, so we just have to, add, we have to demand it, we have to ask for it. So that's, that's essentially kind of where, the, that's where we're at sitting at right now. But I think, kind of again, going back to this idea that why we're doing this is we want to connect with our content. We want to connect with our artists. And this is a way that really brings us deeper into that, that connection right there. So, but you have to ask for it. So with that, um, this is me. So, this is, so, um, uh, so I run a little company called Merkle Acoustic Research and Design. Um, basically, it's a boutique manufacturer and acoustic consulting. So um, I love talking about I live, eat, and breathe this stuff. I also, have, I also teach at UC Denver. I run the recording arts program there. Um, but I love, I, so I do a lot of surround, I do video game tech, I do creative coding, I do a lot of that kind of stuff there. So I, I, I live and breathe sound. And then I run a, my, my artist collection is called Signal Noise Media Labs. And that's, we, we, we show at like music festivals and at, uh, we do a lot of art installations and stuff. So uh, I have a lot, of, a lot of different things around town. So I have a couple different email addresses right there. Uh, but yeah, if you want to come over, I'm going to be playing for the rest of the afternoon over at Red Rock 8. And just if you want to listen to some of the stuff, I'm doing kind of weird, just kind of ambient and electronic stuff today. So I usually we sort of hook up, I have some analog synths and stuff too that we can hook up, some mugs. Uh, it's pretty trippy. Uh, it's pretty fun, but pretty annoying to listen to too. <laughs> so, uh, but it's super fun. So with that, um, is there any questions? It, it, it does. So he asked, how, how dependent is it to be in the sweet spot? Yes, it does matter. But what we found is that it, 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 it matters a lot less than you would think. So in our empirical studies at the planetarium, when we did kind of, there's a number of different ways you can pull off panning in 3D. And um, there's things that are called VBAP and uh, Amazonics and these other kind of formats. And what we found in just our just like crude empirical studies of, of an audience, we would take it and we would try different formats that when we use Amazonics, that even if you're not sitting, like, so at the, the, you know, at the theater, you know, we always know that the, the best spot is gonna be middle center kind of thing. But in real world, if you show up 20 minutes late to a film, you're gonna have to get stuck off to the side or to the front. And what we found uh, is if you don't use, well, with the Amazonics, it's still, it, it's better, but you don't feel like the speaker is right there, even though it is, because usually when, um, when you pan something over there, it's gonna use a, a significant array of speakers to create that effect of where something is coming from. So even if you're not in the perfect right spot, it, it still is pretty effective. So like in, in the ring of speakers that I use, like I have a similar array to what I have over in the room here, is that I'll be, a lot of times I'll be sitting outside of the ring, and if I have something spinning around, I can totally, and of course I, I know the system well, but I can, essentially visualize, I can hear the thing moving around in a circle or spinning up and down as it's, as it's, even though I'm on the outside of the ring. So if you're inside of the ring, you can hear it move really well, but you, but you do feel closer to the speakers if you're off center. So ideally you want to be in the center, but if you have an, an, a fairly large audience, it's still, 
especially if you marry it with visuals, it's a very, it's a very convincing experience. But yes, you do want to, you, there is a, definitely a sweet spot, you know, equidistant. Amazonics, Amazonics the, one of the big problems with it is that it assumes that your speakers are equidistant and you have to be on a sphere. So all the speaker, speakers need to be spherical. So one of the things that we do, because we don't have a sphere a lot, of, I mean, I do have a dome, but like over in the room over here, I don't have it set up as a dome. So what I do is I time delay the, the lower speakers out to be the equivalent of on a dome. But the problem with that is now when you're off axis, you get more smearing, your localization. And what, usually what, what suffers the most is the localization. You still hear everything, but you, don't, you can't place where it is in three dimension quite as accurately as, as if you were in the sweet spot. Good question. Anything else? Okay. Have I ever tried it outdoors? Yes. In fact, that's where I spend most of my time. I spend 90% of my time outdoors with this thing. It is the best acoustics you can have, right? The best, the best absorber is an open window. And so when you're outside, everything goes, so there's no reflections. So you get very good compared to, I mean, like, got like a two second reverb time in here, right? So that can be a problem. And, and, and I, like, when I set up, uh, so I've set up next to, we did, uh, what was it, a couple years ago, we did a Maker Fair. We were on concrete ground next to like an on-ramp of a highway. And it was like us to that. And it was like awful. It was, and you couldn't tell where anything was coming from. So, um, I, we, we, so my, my, most of my rigs are for outdoor use. And I love it. We do have it as an indoor. And it, what, what I find what suffers on the indoor stuff is if you don't have treated rooms, very heavily treated rooms, if you have staccato effects, you do get some like weird slapbacks, and you're, again, you're, your localization suffers, and it's, and you get room modes, and you know all the all the sufferings of, of general acoustics. But um, yeah, most of, most of what I do is outdoors. So I have like a ring of uh, ring of speakers. We got an artist grant a few years ago, and um, it's about a 60 foot ring of speakers that we bring. It's a 16.1 that we bring outside, and it's uh, all. It's all solar powered, which is a lot of fun. So we're completely solar driven. So we can go off grid and take it to the mountains or go to the beaches or, or whatever we want with it. And then just two weeks ago, we brought a dome version of an eight meter dome, 16.1 to Burning Man two weeks ago. And it rocked, it was really fun. We just did an interactive work out there. Probably didn't get a lot of traction though. Cause it looks like if you've been to Burning Man, there's a million domes, they all look the same. So ours is, so it's hard to show that we were doing something way different. Ours looks like a dome like everybody else's, but it was really fun. Cool. No, he was just giving thumbs up. <laughs> thumbs up. Thank you. Cool. All right. Thank you, guys. Well, come on over and play in a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go grab some lunch, and then I'm going to open up the room. So if you want to swing by in a little bit, come play. We got, we got some fun demo stuff, and then have a great rest of the show. See you guys.